Rather than the simple presentation of research, I'm going to also and chiefly give you a story about research. Now I think with psychedelic research, this is particularly important because it often comprises and is based upon personal relationships and connections which are often absent in other forms of research. It's often a lot more intimate. And I think talking about research is very useful as well as psychedelic research because it tends to get a rougher rise than most normal types of research within the broader community. So I think it's useful to be able to share some of the frustrations that we find and even some of the failures that we experience. So the story in question is about the spiritual use in inverted commas of dextromethorphan or DXM which when consumed in large amounts, and I mean quite large, can result in some dissociative or psychedelic effects. Now I first became aware of DXM back in 2004, relatively late to the game. At that time I was a contributor to an online discussion forum that had formed around Daniel Pinchbeck's book, Breaking Open the Head, which I'm sure many of you here are aware of. Now whatever your feelings about Pinchbeck's more recent prophetic turn in recent years, I mean that first book was a pretty solid book and there was lots of very um, smart people who were drawn around it. And I suppose between the years of maybe 2003 to 2005, the discussion forum around that book was particularly vibrant and um, attracted, as I say, a lot of smart people talking about psychedelics, naturally enough, but also other themes like sustainability, spirituality, all the kind of good stuff that we're all here to talk about. Now, one particular member of the community went by the moniker of Half Glass, and he both entertained and challenged us with his inner voyages using DXM. Now, his postings were both chaotic and random, but they were also fascinating in their quest for existential and spiritual meaning. And along with others on the community, I encouraged him to try and formalise his accounts in some way into a manuscript, which he did, and, um, and he self-published in a book called The DXM Explorer. Now, the book carrying his real name of Dan Carpenter it was pretty rough, it was photocopied and spiral bound. And on the cover, which you can see onto the left hand side of the screen here, it's got a photo of Dan, he's got a kind of a notebook and a compass, looking up into some kind of cosmic void, somewhat tongue in cheek, charting his inner travels. Now he published this book and he gave it away for free basically to anybody who was interested. He sent it in the post, he also paid for the shipping. And he sent it to me all the way over. I was living in New Zealand at the time, in the South Island of New Zealand, which is probably as far away from Dan's hometown of Lurton, Pennsylvania, that you can imagine. And the book was pretty good, although it had a certain kind of do-it-yourself charm in both content and form. And by the time I kind of got through reading this book, Dan and I were communicating quite regularly. And I encouraged him to try and... Um, move away from this kind of self-published book to um, some more kind of orthodox and uh, get to get a proper publisher, basically. And for the purposes of this talk here, I went back and looked through some of our emails at the time, which kind of give an almost, an almost seamless journey from Dan's self-published book through to the end product, which was published by Inner Traditions and retitled to echo, I suppose, the spirit of the McKenna brothers into this, what you see on the right-hand side of the Psychonauts' Guide to the Invisible Landscape, the topography of the psychedelic experience. The first email I saw was from July 2004. Now, you know, we were just knocking around on an internet discussion forum. Dan's cranked out this publication, you know, and he's going, oh, yeah, just having a quick conversation with Rick Strassman. He's like, that is going to give me a blurb. He's going to give me the nod to his editor. And I think, yeah, it's fair enough. Six months later, I get another email. Yeah, you know, the book's just sat over in the traditions. It's doing all right. You know, bit of luck, fingers crossed. And then just one month more, you get this other email. These are all verbatim as they came through. And the book's been picked up 
Dan was delighted with, it, with his success and I was delighted with it too. But sadly, before the publication of the book, Dan died and he never got to see what the book looked like on the shelf. Now, when, um, after he died, obviously it was a great shock. And once I had um, got through the shock of his passing, I felt some need to consolidate his work, I suppose, and to bring it in to the academic domain as I was um, a doctoral student at the time. And I suppose to be transparent about motivations, it seemed like a pretty good idea for me to, um, to write something about the cultural use of DXM, because at the time no one else had done it, basically. If you looked around um, at the literature, if you did a literature review back then, you would have seen these kind of things where we see about DXM in its um, medical use for pain relief and so on, or its abuse. But nothing about its cultural or spiritual use. And I achieved this goal via two venues um, back in 2007, the first of which was a sympathetic uh, review of Dan's book in International Journal of Drug Policy, and the second was a research article, which um, the findings of which I'll outline in the second, in Journal of Alternative Spiritualities and New Age Studies. Unbeknown to me, I thought I was being reasonably ahead of the game on this, unbeknown to me, someone else was thinking along similar lines and was writing an article which was published pretty much at the same time as mine, um, and that article was by Peter Addy, which you can see a reference for there, um, I believe Des, who we heard from yesterday with his stimulants talk, was also thinking about DXM um, whilst he was writing his doctoral thesis on DMT. Um, I'm sure there are others. The point being is yeah, I wasn't the only one having these thoughts. There are plenty of people. But I, can't, I was in there relatively early, though. So I read up these findings in this article towards a sacramental understanding of dextromethorphan. Now, in order to do this, I needed to plug the DXM findings into some kind of vaguely recognisable theoretical framework. Now, we all know here what entheogens are about, but I wanted to find a way of communicating um, these findings for people who had no psychedelic context, who maybe were a bit sceptical, which is why I decided to privilege the word sacrament in the title. Now, I'm a theologian by training, um, so in order to try and provide some definition around that, I turned first to um, the Protestant theologian and Christian existentialist Paul Tillich. Now, Paul Tillich, he described a sacrament as any object or event is sacramental in which the transcendent is perceived to be present. In a similar kind of fashion, John Macquarie, he's a systematic theologian, John Macquarie, when citing the Anglican Catechism, he describes a sacrament as an outward and physical sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Now, clearly that doesn't have the pharmacological element of an entheogen, but again, I wanted to communicate it in a way where it would be a bit more pal palatable to someone who is sceptical. I then alluded to some kind of nature of neo-shamanism, which, as you probably know, is a way of, kind of, um, of people experiencing traditional shamanic techniques of altered states of consciousness, but within uh, largely contemporary and more diverse contexts. There's a ton of new writing around this kind of stuff, but I chose instead to go back to the source, I suppose, of Michael Harner's um, book, The Way of the Shaman, and he offers various, various examples of kind of transcultural <coughs> neo-shamanic um, experiences such as these. I've got the soul's separation from the body, visions of snakes and jaguars, demons and deities, distant cities, landscapes and persons, and divinatory experiences such as, as resolving crimes or sickness. I then had to talk a little bit about entheogens, of course, so I looked at um, the William Richards' paper, which is of entheogens and the study of mystical and archetypal experiences. Um, and he says of those, they can be characterised by unity, transcendence of time and space, objectivity and reality, a sense of sacredness, deeply felt positive mood, and ineffability and paradoxicality. I did a few other kind of theoretical twists and turns along the way, but in a nutshell, the argument was that DXM use, or at least some users of DXM, could be located very loosely within the neo-shamanic tradition if some of those users considered DXM um, as a sacrament, 
if some of those users had experiences which echoed the kind of themes expressed by Hana and Williams just here. And I did that by looking uh, firstly at Dan's book, seeing the kind of um, experiences that he wrote about there. And I used to, and I looked also at William White's online dextromethorphan FAQ, which is a kind of been around for years, uh, pretty much the first port of call for anyone doing research on DXM. I had a look too at 16 editions of the DXM zine, which is an online publication. Uh, it was published between 1997 and 2003. And like everyone else as well, I also consulted the area with database looking at some first-hand accounts that were published between 2000 and 2003. So that was the source material that I was using. Now, not too many people um, know a lot about DXM, so it might be worth um, noting that it's a kind of an unlikely candidate, I suppose, uh, for mystical experiences, considered as it is to be a rather juvenile or poor man's drug. On those rare occasions when it does hit the news headlines, we see things like, uh, what have we got here, kids overdosing on cold medicine to get high, or teenagers get high on cough pills, which are real headlines. In his FAQ, White suggests that the DXM culture has been around um, probably back to the 1960s beatnik era, but that in the 70s it kind of declined in popularity due to the rise of alternative substances like LSD, POD and so forth, although he imagines um, US soldiers were using DXM a fair bit in Vietnam. But the DXM kind of had a bit of a renaissance in the 1980s due to the hardcore punk community. <coughs> Writing in the 1990s, when um, White did that FAQ, he was saying that the internet had, was completely changing the face of DXM usage, which certainly confirms a lot of papers that have been written about um, the effect of communication via online communities on psychoactive substances. And indeed, this kind of internet online uh, context proved to be a bit problematic for me um, later on when I was trying to, um, to articulate the nature of the community, I suppose, and we'll get, get to that a bit later on. So despite these most, hardly the most spiritual of origins, there's plenty of evidence about um, that the DXM community are thinking in spiritual terms almost from the start. Now in the, um, in the DXM FAQ, the DXM experience is categorised into five plateaus, which gives you an idea about the general um, experience of the DXM. The first and second lower plateaus are characterised by alertness and mild sensory deprivation and distortion, um, some very mild dissociative effects. Um, on the third and fourth plateaus, we see experiences that are generally had lying down with closed eyes. That's certainly... Um, given to be true looking at Dan's book. Well, I think he spent the whole book lying on the sofa, basically, with one arm out doing notes and so forth. And um, a, ca a calm akin to meditation is, um, is, is known to descend upon people in that third plateau. In the fourth plateau, out-of-body experiences start to happen. And we're, we're told that we see contact with external and superior beings. In the fifth somewhat elusive plateau sigma we're characterised as seeing more of these superior beings alien life forms, gods but in this case we're no longer lying on the sofa having closed eye visions but rather we're seeing these things in waking reality now White says in his FAQ that these upper plateaus are distinctly less recreational than the lower plateaus and are characterised by a more kind of introspective, spiritual, and shamanic intention. That's a quote from, from White. Most people use the DXM for psychonautical exploration or spiritual work. They do so at the upper plateaus. Now, as I say, that FAQ is the first port of call for anybody looking into information on DXM. So pretty much straight away, we're seeing that some people at least, not saying the whole community, but that some people within that community are thinking about spiritual terms. And similarly, when we read copies of the DXM zine, which is still online now, every single issue of the DXM zine ran at least one or maybe more articles that were focused around subjects which intersect in some kind of way with spirituality and altered states of consciousness, including 
paranormal and psychic experiences, what they describe as coincidence control, but which is basically synchronicity, near death and out of body experiences, astral projection, lucid dreaming, ESP, communicating with the dead, Kundalini and chakra energies, and the 2012 eschaton. Every single issue was talking about these issues. One issue, even, of the DXM zine went on to talk about the Church of Tussin, Tussin from Robotussin, the main source of DXM. <laughs> That's chuckle-worthy, but it's very serious. I mean, it's, you know, the, the intentionality behind these things is... Um, you know, I, I, I'll give you a quick moment to read this, this quote here about what the Church of Tussin is supposedly about. Um, yeah, the, the initial response is, is to chuckle, but when you see it within the context of the broader discussion that this quote comes from, you can see that people, uh, they're, they're pretty straight up about this. They're pretty straight up about it. And again, when you read the first-hand reports of DXM on Arrowhead, we read a similar story. Amongst various examples, the anonymous Matt writes, I'm not particularly religious, but I felt God speaking to me and telling me that everything was all right. The Shadow, for example, writes, that I felt as though I had a connection with God, one that I'd never had before. The anonymous Oki, I'm not sure if it's a he or she, but let's say it was a she, Oki writes, simply that the account was called, I Saw God. Now if we then go and look at Carpenter's text and then try and compare that and map it on to William's um, characteristics of the entheogenic mystical experience, we see very similar things. Now, Carpenter states right from the start that my, my approach, quote, has always been absolutely spiritual. So if we have a quick run through those, uh, those characteristics of the mystical experience by Richards, the first of which was unity. Now, Carpenter states here, there are fabrics of groups of people, the known in the hive. The hive is like the hive mind. It's kind of uh, collective consciousness. That there, there, there is known in the hive is fabrics of awareness. There are families chatting. They're knitted together into a quilt. It's a good idea of unity. Williams talks about transcendence of time and space. Dan says, the world kept coming over me as a new world, one I had just entered, a reality I had just arrived in. Each time this happened, I had to create a new scenario about who and where I was. It's a good idea of transcendence of time and space. William talks of objectivity and reality. Dan says, all the crazy comings and goings were self-regulated by the parts themselves, like a host of hardened ER doctors in action after a bus, bus crash. The psychedelic had held a door open onto the one me, allowing another me to see in. Different idea of objectivity and reality. Williams talks about that sense of sacredness. Dan says, beliefs in the solid state yet spiritual realms, one could be witness these in the closed eye DXM, DXM trance. Again, the sense of sacredness. Williams talked about that deeply, sense, deeply held sense of positive mood. This is one of my favourite quotes from the book that Dan comes up with. It gives a kind of good understanding of how tongue-in-cheek he was. He says, I found myself drifting over a scene of unmistakable Buddhist monks. I could smell incense. There was a high seat of honour, and I understood it was for me. The monks were saying, he's made it. This is Dan's day. Peace be upon him. Suddenly, something went wrong, like a chair broke or something. Then one young man approached me, smiling, and I understood that the broken chair had been a cosmic joke of some kind, like a hazing. The young man said to me, this is the first enlightenment, and we both began to laugh heartily. Finally, Williams talks about ineffability and paradoxicality. And Dan says simply, I have witnessed the seat of dreaming. He had a nice turn of phrase. He made a living, you know, decorating houses and so forth. It wasn't as if he was kind of well-trained in this, but it, he had a lovely turn of phrase. So I invite you, I suppose, to, to have a read of the full-length paper to look at a lengthier presentation of the kind of theoretical framework that I used, um, many of the evidence which I've only just really skirted over here, and to see a lot of the extra references. But it was certainly clear 
when writing that paper and putting it together that some users, again, not all, some users consider DXM to have a sacramental nature. It's clear that those transcultural shamanic themes articulated by both Hana and those mystical experiences of the entheogenic context type by Williams are experienced by some users of DXM. I thought it was a watertight case, personally, but um, in this final section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the reception of this material. <laughs> and somewhat naively, I assumed, I was only a doctoral student at the time, so I can be forgiven, somewhat naively, I assumed that because no one had ever written about this kind of cultural or spiritual use of DXM within an academic context, that this exploration would be absorbed with some kind of relish. But this, probably quite obviously, was not the case. Now this is a bit that you don't hear too much in conferences. This is a bit in the paper where I tell you about how crap everyone said my research was. Now it's quite a few years ago now, so I've kind of, time has passed on, I've got over it, uh, so I can talk about it now, and I offer it as a learning tool, I suppose. I offer it as a learning tool to younger researchers about the kind of mistakes that people can make, and I offer it as a reminder, I suppose, for you know, those more experienced researchers um, amongst us about what happens when you don't really toe the party line to quite the right level. Now, my first outing with this paper was in 2006, and it was at the Association of social anthropologists of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now, the first obstacle that I had at this conference was the general scepticism that this couldn't be anything else than a bunch of kids looking for kicks. Which, you know, there's not a lot you can say about that. The evidence suggested otherwise. The second objection was more sophisticated, um, but also quite curious, more curious in some way. And that was the denial, flat out denial, that the DXM community could be considered a community because it was chiefly online and geographically dispersed. The argument then became one that I couldn't seriously talk about a community that I couldn't describe accurately with demographic data. Now I hope four years down the line with the explosion of um, both the practice of social media and also the academic study of social media and online communities, that such an objection wouldn't be quite so vocal today. Certainly when I speak to students these days, they all, they're quite puzzled as to how anybody could, um, could deny the, the reality of a community that didn't meet in, in person all the time or that you couldn't describe demographically. I'm sure many of you here um, are involved in online communities with people that you've never met but have a great sense of meaning and value in those relationships that you've created sometimes over the years. I know I certainly have. But unperturbed, unperturbed, I went on to submit this paper to an academic journal that was known for its publishing of articles based on new religious movements and alternative spiritualities. Again, I ran into problems. From the six people who fed into the peer review, and I'll say that again, six people fed into that peer review. That just doesn't happen very often. Not in the humanities and social sciences, at least, when you might get two or three. Someone was paying attention with this paper. Now, I don't want to give the impression that there was no positive feedback, because in some of them there was. Reader One, for example, they were sympathetic to the paper, but suggested that I spend more time theorising the relationship between entheogens and neo-shamanism, which is fair enough, but of course if I had spent more time theorising that relationship, I wouldn't have had much time to actually tell you anything about DXM. Reader 4. Reader 4 thought the paper was well-written and well-researched, in very good shape and close to being ready to go. I was quite pleased with that. That was good. Reader 5 also had some sympathy for the paper. We've got three out of three spares, not bad. But they wanted to keep the paper away from the journal. They say, quote, this paper is not unsophisticated. It is very well researched and very well written. But in the end, it may be easier for the author to submit his or her paper to a more appropriate journal. In short, go away, you freaky drug man. 
However, and this is when it started turning around a bit, Reader 2, Reader 2 asks if there is indeed any significance to the discussion in the paper, criticising the, um, the apologetic sense that he or she perceived, speculating that I'm a member of the DXM community who's somehow trying to uh, uh, make way for, for some kind of, um, yeah, some apologetic for the community. And then after that, they fall in line, despite the fact that they've been talking about the community, they fall in line with the, with the criticism from the conference in suggesting that I can't actually talk about a community in the first place because I don't have that demographic data. I've since learned that to be biased towards your subject of inquiry is to have um, to, you know, that sense of apologia, to be a, a, apologetic for the subject, but to be biased against a community is analysis. It's a very subtle kind of distinction between where your bias lies. Reader three, they repeat those issues and queries about the demographic issue, although condescendingly, I thought, admits that the paper, quote, might be interest to one who remembers and has some nostalgia for the 60s. There's something about that remark that really irked me, really got under my skin. You know, it's, it's both dismissive of the topic and it's also kind of got this generational arrogance to it, as if, you know, it's all been done back in the 60s, what else is there left to be said? And then the final reader, reader six. While those other readers, I suppose, were questioning the nature of what they perceived to be evidence from a social science point of view, reader six wanted me to, uh, to frame the paper within a history of religions perspective. I'm gonna provide you with this on a slide, of just so you can get the exact terminology that was used here. I'll give you a couple of seconds to look at it. I've looked at this comment quite a few times over the years, and I still don't really understand it. As far as I can tell, to have satisfied this reviewer's requirements, all I would have needed to have done was to have made a few changes in grammar, to have made a few perceives, a few as ifs, um, for example, I had originally um, a headline, a, a heading of DXM um, is a sacrament. Whereas according to the history of religion's perspective, um, if I'd have written DXM as a sacrament, it would have stuck it within the um, appropriately distant and non-normative um, faith claim view. But those kind of seemingly uh, small changes were considered too fundamental for me to be invited to revise and resubmit the paper. Now the scary thing is, is that I found myself trotting out this argument myself on occasion. Just this semester alone I've had a few students who were writing essays about various neo-shamanic phenomena and I found myself saying that is a normative faith claim. And I can't quite tell if I'm doing these students a favour by showing them how, that they, how to write about interesting things um, in a way that is acceptable to these kind of gatekeepers, or whether or not I'm just shoring up the orthodoxy along the way. I'm genuinely torn. I just, I'm not quite sure what kind of role I'm playing here. Now, of course, it goes without saying that it's the role of the peer reviewers to weed out the nonsense from the scientific record. However, the overall impression that I got, bearing in mind the first three reviewers are actually relatively positive about this, the overall impression that I got was that the reviews were less about identifying fatal flaws in my argument and more about finding ways to reject the research because of the content of the argument. Now, I've spent the past five years editing my own academic journal and I've come to understand the difference between these two strategies with some clarity. And I think as well, for anyone who's working in the academic domain, this is a useful point because it highlights some of the problems about methods and targeting the correct kind of journal for your work. I take a generally a kind of a content analysis point of view, which is basically I read stuff and say what I think about it. My presentation and interpretation of that content is my evidence, in inverted commas. But if you take that kind of methodology and send it to a social science journal, for example, they pretty much just think you're making it up. Despite the fact that those very same journals 
will present what they perceive to be evidence completely uncritically as if it were true. So it's a good lesson about kind of, you know, if you're going to do this kind of work, do this kind of research, how you've got to target things very, very subtly to, how, to where you're going to, to be able to get it published. In the end, I'm grateful that the paper found a home in Journal of Alternative Spiritualities and New Age Studies. Now, despite, despite the fact that this paper had a rough journey at both the first conference that I presented at and the first journal to which I submitted, it nevertheless still interests people. Perhaps even more than my primary kind of vaguely mainstream research of masculinity and religion, it's this paper which results in a disproportionate amount of emails from people who have read the paper and find it interesting, emails from students who are interested in psychedelic research but are unsure about how best to proceed. And when I highlight the nature, the sacramental nature of DXM to my academic colleagues, they very quickly succumb to the enchanting nature of the subject. Which leads me to believe that DXM, alongside psychedelics in general, alongside a whole host of allegedly fringe subjects, are clearly of interest to a diverse spectrum of researchers, but that this interest is silenced in the academic community. It's silenced by the way that research is produced, by the way that research is regulated, perhaps even by those very same people who secretly find the, in the subject to be of interest in the first place. Those very same, pe same people, at least, who aren't wearing their temporary uniform, their dark uniform of the knowledge police. And that, I think, is a, a useful point on which to speak um, and to conclude on the nature of knowledge production. Kind of getting back to kind of what I was suggesting on the panel earlier on. The assumption is that the university is the main site of intellectual investigation, but that assumption is looking increasingly fragile. The general figure quoted is that 50% of the teaching done in universities is now done by sessional staff. Ongoing jobs for qualified researchers are increasingly thin on the ground. However, plenty of those researchers who currently have rather tenuous relationships with the universities, or none at all, and they're just out there stacking shelves in supermarkets, they're still engaged in research and writing. In my subject area of religious studies, I'd probably be bold enough to say that most of the interesting work being done in Australia is being done by people who don't have proper academic jobs. So while psychedelic research may be resisted for various reasons in the mainstream academy, it will probably have a smoother rise in these fringe academic communities of growing significance. That's the point. The point here is that those fringe academic communities may not be fringe for very long. The realities of the job market, for anybody who, has, who knows anything about the academy, will know that we're already at the point where no assumption about the quality of someone's work is made based on whether or not they have a job. Everyone knows now the fact that if you've got a job, it doesn't mean that you're any good, and if you don't have a job, it doesn't mean you're not. Everyone knows that. The nature of the most recent research assessment exercise, the ERA in Australia, is having an even stronger regulatory effect on the kind of work that researchers do and the kind of publication venues that they look for, which will increasingly, I think, stick the brakes on risk-taking and blue-sky thinking within the university. So all this leads to the possibility that those current fringe academic communities have the potential, at least, to, perceive, to be perceived not as the fringe any longer, but the main site of intellectual investigation. Now, there's a very clear historical precedent for this. You only have to look back to the late 1960s in France when you'll see that a lot of the big names that we know characterised in that period, Deleuze, Derrida, Foucault, these kind of guys, back then they had quite tenuous relationships to the academy, yet came on to define a whole generation of thought. So I leave, I suppose, with what can only be a call for arms, I suppose, that for the psychedelic community to align itself with other allegedly fringe research communities to breathe some life into this increasingly dull intellectual tradition in Australia. With that, I'll leave you. Thank you.